Father, we come to thy presence with the attitude of gratitude, Lord, especially who you for you who you are in our lives, O oh Lord. Lord, we are grateful to you because you are a God who doesn't hide and they expect us to seek, but you are a God who would like to willingly come you know, come to our presence to reveal yourself so that we can have fellowship with you, O oh Lord. You came down in Jesus Christ and you became a part of us, one like us, so that we may be able to relate to you and understand you. And you revealed yourself, Lord. That is such an amazing uh, grace that you have shown towards us for which we can never, ever be thankful enough. And as we're going to spend some time in your presence, I pray that your spirit's guidance may be granted to us so that we may be able to recognize uh, Jesus, especially uh, with us and, uh, and in us, O oh Lord, and we may experience you more intimately as never before. The time we spend together and the discussions we make, Lord, may be acceptable in your sight and may be edifying to the body of Christ, O oh Lord. Thank you very much for your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And thank you, Praveen. <clears throat> uh, in the several discussions we have had over the uh, past several months, one topic that maybe kept coming back was the subject of universalism. Uh, we have very briefly discussed that. I don't think we've gone into any uh, great depth or length into that particular subject. Uh, but once again, today, we will not uh, go too much into depth uh, with regards to this subject, but we will, I just want to bring in some thoughts on this. And so one of the reasons why, uh, you know, this particular topic keeps cropping up is because uh, many people think that GCI as a fellowship teaches or subscribes to the, uh, the what do you say, the, the concept of universalism. Universalism, which is taught in different ways, but basically means that all of humanity will be saved at one, you know, sometime in the future, that nobody will be lost. So that is the teaching uh, that the universalism embraces. And many people think that because GCI subscribes to what we have come to call incarnational Trinitarian theology, that this necessarily teaches universalism. And uh, I think uh, over the past several years, we've had to make, uh, what do you say, uh, clarifications, uh, corrections, uh, when people ask the question whether we teach universalism. Uh, in the way it is taught today, the way it is uh, sort of uh, the, the, the concept is unfolded, we cannot, uh, we cannot fully subscribe to that, obviously. And so why don't we, you know, do a little discussion on this? And I'm going to do something slightly different today. What I want to do is first play you a video, which is an older video done by Mr. our former president, Mr. Joseph Picach. And he discusses very briefly what universalism is. Uh, and after that, there is one question that was submitted to our home office and they decided to answer that. And it once again is connected to the subject of universalism. And that, that is, if I can prepare your, your mind to that, the question deals with, do people get a second chance? And the reason they ask that is, well, since God is a loving God, he should be giving us a second chance. I mean, the way second chance is explained, of course, is different with different people. But, we will discuss all of this today, and hopefully we should have enough time to get your questions and the comments that you'd like to make. So what we'll do now is we'll go straight into the video. After that, I'll make a few comments, 
And then I'll get into that question, which I just mentioned a little earlier. So let's go and roll the tape and we will then come back for a short, uh, uh, you know, a recap. Occasionally, people ask me if Grace Communion International teaches universalism. Universalism is a belief that everyone will be saved, regardless of whether or not they are good or bad, have repented of their sins, or have accepted Jesus as their Savior. The answer is no, we do not teach that. The Bible teaches that there is salvation only in Christ. It also tells us, for instance, in 1 Peter 3, 9, that God desires all to come to repentance, and he has created and redeemed humanity for true fellowship with him. In Jesus Christ, who is God's elect for our sakes, all humanity is elect in him as the new Adam. By this I mean that everyone is eligible to receive God's offer of forgiveness of sin and eternal life extended to them by the Holy Spirit. But that does not necessarily mean that all humans will accept that gift. We also believe that in Christ, God makes gracious and just provisions for all, even for those who at death appear not to have yet believed the gospel. So careful students of the Bible recognize that. Whereas the scriptures do not enable us to determine ahead of time the final state of everyone, we need not rule out the power and grace of God to fulfill his desire to save everyone. However, there may be some who remain stubbornly hostile to God, repudiating grace, rejecting their Savior, they would not enter into their salvation. It's hard to believe that anyone would make a choice like that. But if we are to be faithful to Scripture, we must allow it as a possibility. The important thing to remember is that it is their choice, not their destiny. As C.S. Lewis shrewdly observed, the doors of hell are locked from the inside. God has done everything possible to save us from the terrible and horrific condition that is hell. He has given us his son, Jesus, as our representative and substitute to stand in for us as our high priest. And the Spirit works to draw us so that we can share in all the benefits held for us in Christ. Yet in the end, we cannot presume upon the grace of God and dogmatically declare that God will indeed violate the deliberate choice of those who willfully and persistently reject his love and turn away from him and his Spirit. So even though we cannot say for certain that all humans will ultimately accept God's gift, surely we can hope that is the case. That is, after all, what God has said he desires, and surely wanting what God desires does not make you a heretic. I'm Joseph Tkach, speaking of life. Well, just to uh, uh, just recap, and I think you uh, you understood what uh, Mr. Dikach was saying, that uh, definitely God's desire is to see uh, nobody to be lost. And he did not create humanity for destruction or condemnation. We know that from scripture. We also know that Christ's sacrifice covers uh, all humans, it is uh, universal in, in the sense that it draws all people and it's available to all people uh, that ever existed. Uh, but to be faithful to scripture, as Mr. Pikach has said, that the Bible seemed to indicate that some may decide not to accept the grace of God. Right, uh, and they stubbornly remain uh, convinced of their own, you know, uh, way that they want to choose. It's a choice that they make. That's very interesting that he mentions that it's a choice, not a destiny. So God did not destine anyone or predestine anyone for damnation, but hoping that all would be saved. Now, hoping that all would be saved or should be saved is not a heretical thought uh, because God himself seemed to indicate that that's his heart. So I leave it at that in case you have any 
questions or comments you'd like to make about the subject of universalism itself, uh, feel free that we can discuss it uh, a little later. All right, what I want to do now is, based on this, many people have, or rather the Home Office received a question, and I'm going to share my screen and basically do a lot of reading. So uh, I think Bertie is going to be at a loss without his spectacles, but I still hope that he can catch uh, the, uh, the, the, what do you say, the uh, logic of what we will discuss in the answer. So give me just a moment as I share my screen. Okay, so you can see the question on the screen. And the question reads as follows, and this is after an article called readiness, but don't worry about that. I just read the article, the question says readiness, the GCI update, and that brought up a question in my mind. I was told that a person can repent after death and receive salvation. I do not understand that in what I read in the Bible. Is that a belief of GCI? If so, how does that differ from universalism? So that's the question. Uh, you know, that can someone, you could almost say like a, get a second chance, repent even after death. Okay. Um, uh, the response is by Dr. Gary Dedo, who is the president of our seminary. And I'll just go straight away into the response. And I have highlighted some, some in yellow. Uh, just for uh, some emphasis on those crucial points that uh, Gary mentioned. So let me go ahead and read the answer. And then after that, I will make some, uh, you know, observations about the answer, and then we can get into our discussion. The answer reads, thank you for your query. No, the uh, answer is no. GCI does not teach that persons will necessarily be given a chance to repent after death. Nor do we teach that all persons will necessarily receive their salvation. That is universalism. So that's one way to explain universalism. Continuing, we do not find any biblical teaching that affirms such an idea. Rather, much biblical teaching assumes or entails that God's grace will be sufficient in any person's lifetime mainly through the faithful working of the spirit and by the word of God. All right, so very clearly there, GCI does not teach it. God's grace is sufficient. Okay, let's carry on then. There are several forms of universalism, and this might be interesting for you to understand and to notice. One form is that all will be saved whether or not anyone repents turns to Christ for forgiveness on the basis of his atoning work of the cross. Another form is that everyone sooner or later in this life or the next will repent and turn to Christ for forgiveness on the basis of his atoning work on the cross. And so in that way, all will be saved or receive their salvation. There is a difference in these universalisms. But GCI teaches neither. Okay. Those who pursue such universalisms do so, it would seem, on the basis of logical inferences, which are never logical, logically or theologically necessarily true, which they believe will follow from the biblical truth that Christ died for all and that God is merciful both of which GCI does teach, along with much of the Christian church. Just for you to make a, uh, you know, to notice there, GCI teaches that God is merciful and that Christ died for all. That is what we teach, but we don't teach universalism. Continuing, they cannot see how God could be merciful if persons were not given another chance, other chances, or you could say a second chance on the other side of death. So they make the unwarranted logical inference that God necessarily must do so. Carrying on. However, such a false logic overlooks the fact that God being the merciful Lord at work by his spirit on the basis of Christ's 
completed earthly work could give all the chances or opportunities needed in this life to every person. There is no need to speculate about chances after death. In the merciful providence of God, death is never an arbitrary limit, an unanticipated accident from God's vantage point. All that needed to be done and could be done can be accomplished by God and through the Holy Spirit in a person's earthly life, even if in the last nanoseconds of a person's life while they are unconscious. There is no reason to believe otherwise and biblical reasons to believe so. We cannot limit God's faithfulness to the pragmatics of ours, which is indeed limited by all kinds of circumstances such as mental illness, accident, geographical or cultural distance, uh, and death. So if death is not an arbitrary limit to God and his grace, no speculation as to second chances after death is needed in order to uphold God's mercy and grace and the biblical fact that God sent Jesus Christ out of love for the world and that he gave his life to take away the sins of the cosmos. But given this, while we might hope that all will receive their salvation, there is no biblical guarantee that all will necessarily receive this freely given gift of God. And there are many warnings that it is somehow possible that some might reach a place of no turning back and never enter the kingdom of God, or receive, the, uh, receive their Savior and Lord and his salvation. While there are very strong warnings of this sort, GCI does not uh, follow another false logical inference that some people necessarily must be eternally separated from the immediate presence and complete blessings of God. The warnings indicate a true, even if unwanted possibility, but not a necessity. Warnings are given not to indicate a desire for the warned against outcome, but to contribute to its prevention. God warns because he loves us and had provided everything for us in grace and by the spirit so that we have no excuse for rep repudiating his grace. If there are those who manage to do so, it will not be due to a limit to God's grace. Okay, so that is from Dr. Gary Dedo, uh, President Grace Communion Seminary. What I'm gonna do is stop my share there. Let me make some observations from that and uh, we will then get into our discussion. Obviously the question is a, a, a tough one, uh, very difficult for us to answer. Once again, we are getting into speculative territory. And, uh, but like Mr. Dikaj said that, you know, to, to be faithful to scripture is very essential and we must not say anything beyond it or, uh, you know, or, or say something that it actually says. So a few observations. One is notice it says God's grace is sufficient. That's a very powerful, um, you know, statement to make because uh, that is exactly what we have been discussing even in the past, that uh, uh, when we discussed about law keeping, we very clearly prove or, you know, the scriptures seem to prove that God's grace is sufficient. When I say God's grace is sufficient, we need to understand that his grace is also beyond human logic, right? It is not just sufficient, but we need to recognize that I don't think we can, we can capture God's grace entirely in our logical minds, right? Sometimes God's grace seems contradictory to our logic. And I think it is necessary for us to note that. For example, you know, in Romans chapter 5 and verse 20, uh, let me just quickly read that for you. 
uh, you may have, um, you may remember that scripture. Uh, just getting my Bible out. Um, I'm going to Romans chapter 5. And I'll begin to read from verse 20. Uh, uh, let me begin at verse 19. It says, for just as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so also to, through the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Verse 20, the law came along to multiply the trespass, but where sin multiplied, grace multiplied even more. Some translations have it, grace abounds when sin abounds, all right? Now that sounds a little uh, kind of strange, but I'll, I'll just come back to it in a moment. Verse 21 says, so that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace will reign through righteousness, resulting in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, what, what I understand that verse 20 means when it says, if sin abounds, grace will abound even more. What I understand that is, sin can never overtake grace. You know, or in other words, grace can never run out, or God never runs out on grace, right? Uh, no matter what the sin is, grace, God's grace co can cover all aspects of that sinfulness, right? So, uh, all I would say is sin cannot quench God's grace, right? So God's grace is sufficient, and that's something that we need to keep in mind. Another uh, point I'd like to observe from the, uh, from the answer is Christ's completed work. Once again, we have mentioned this many a times, but uh, it bears repeating. Christ's completed work and once again, it is much more than we can fully understand. But we continue to struggle. I think many of us continue to struggle to think that for some reason, we need to supplement Christ's work, you know, in the incarnation and on the cross. Somehow we need to sort of uh, do something to add to Christ's work. And that is once again, false logic. Uh, it goes against our own logic. One important observation, and maybe this could be something that is more close to the answer to the question that was asked, and that is, for God, death is not a limitation. All right? We are saying that can somebody repent after death? Well, uh, we, uh, you know, the, the answer seem to indicate no. Uh, but what we need to understand is death is not a limitation for God to save someone. If somebody died, now for example, and this was going through my mind I was, as I was studying this. What if a child dies before the child knows anything about, you know, uh, a child, maybe in infancy? Is the child lost? Uh, what if a person is, uh, what you say, born with a mental illness where he will never be able to cognitively understand God's, the gospel of Jesus Christ? Is he lost? Uh, you know, once again, we don't have a direct answer in the Bible. But what we have to recognize is that is not a limitation for God. God can still work beyond it. His grace goes beyond that. And that is something very satisfying to know. Okay. Uh, it seemed to indicate that the answer also seemed to indicate that salvation is lost by rejection. Salvation is not lost by death or inaccessibility to the gospel of Jesus or infancy or the, or the what you say, uh, the inability to understand it. In, in, our, in our analysis, from what we have read in the scriptures, salvation can be lost only through a rejection. Right? It is never 
And I may want to repeat that. It is never because God did not sufficiently provide for someone to be saved. All right. Uh, God has, like the answer says, sufficiently provided and nothing is a limitation for him in terms of everyone having a fair chance to salvation. And it is nice to know that Christ is, you know, full of grace. I mean, that's what John says. Uh, he is full of grace. I mean, we worship a God who's full of grace and a God who's so gracious can never, you know, can never let anyone slip through his fingers, you know, metaphorically speaking. Now, none is going to be lost through his fingers. Finally, I just want to mention, uh, we don't have an explicit answer to the question that was asked, but we have an explicit answer to the question, who God is. And we always come back to that who question, isn't it? Who is this God that we worship? You see, when we know the answer to that question, then we can be sure that God is not an arbitrary God or a vindictive God. God is not a forgetful God, that his grace is not sufficient. We know that we worship a God who is uh, love, you know, in short, to put it encapsulated in one word, he's love. And if he is love, he can never, ever let anyone to be lost because of his mistake, you could say, you know, uh, quote unquote, his mistake, right? Even though we cannot understand how some people who may not have had the opportunities that we may have had, uh, we do know that we worship a God of grace and he will provide for all the lacunas, provide for all the shortcomings uh, in terms of salvation for humanity. And I'll end with this. The fact that we know the truth, the fact that we have been given and we have the faculty of mind to understand the truth may be something for us to take very seriously because God wants us to be saved. He has done everything for us to be saved. And we should never fall, you know, uh, wanting on that. Uh, we should never ever come to that stage where we would unfortunately reject the wonderful salvation he has for us. With that, I will uh, end today's, uh, this, I mean to say, uh, presentation. We will get into a discussion. We have some some time today for discussion. So go ahead and uh, start firing away your questions. <laughs> go ahead, yes. So um, <laughs> in short, we still don't know really. I mean, it's, it's better to say that how God will save those who have not even heard of Christ in their lifetime? That is the short answer, right? Because that was my first uh, question, I think, uh, two or three Bible studies ago. That how, how will God save those? And are they truly uh, you know, lost? And uh, maybe they're not lost, but we don't know how God will open their minds. Is that correct to say? I would, I would say yes to that. Because uh, once again, I cannot go to any scripture. In the past, we used to do that. We used to talk about a second resurrection. Oh, yeah. We used to talk about a third resurrection. And we think those resurrections are second chances. You know, yeah. uh, I, 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 we, we don't subscribe to that because it doesn't talk about that. You know, even though they may, uh, it talks about 100 years and all of that. Uh, we, 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 really, we really can't be dogmatic on that. But so I would say yes. God, we don't know how, but we cannot say that there is no provision for them to be saved. Right. Yeah. Correct. You are you're repeating, you have a second question, Anil? No, no, that's fine. Okay, right. <laughs> uh, since you mentioned that, I may also just want to mention, you know, we talk about second chances. 
I sometimes don't understand what we mean by second chance. Do you know that we have millions of chances? You know, every single day we live, we make a mistake, don't we? We, we, we falter in our faith. We uh, continue to live contrary to the gospel. So to that extent, what are we talking about second chances? God is constantly gracious and the, uh, the, pro the what do you call it, the parable of the prodigal son, I mean, talks about that so eloquently that the question of second chances is, is it's not, God is not a God of second chances. I mean, he's a God of million chances, you know, in that respect. So can you imagine the grace God has for someone, uh, you know, people like us who constantly falter and yet he does not withdraw his love from us. His grace always remains. He has promised never to leave us, nor to forsake us. Uh, you know, I think that that should be mentioned. Yes, Vanessa, you had a thought. Uh, looks like you have a question. Yes, yes. Uh, what I wanted to ask is that, okay, uh, we are getting second chance now in our lives. Every day we are given a, a second chance to better ourselves or uh, help others, love and forgive and uh, Okay, so the ones I'm talking about, the ones who have already dead and gone. Now, when judgment day comes, don't you think that uh, God will give some of them a second chance? So, see, like, so pray. we pray like my mother, my father, my, my uh, family, those who have uh, died and gone. So everyone wants to meet their, meet their loved ones in heaven. So we don't know whether they are going to be the chosen ones or the not. So we, of course, pray for them, to for God to have mercy on them. And maybe on their judgment day, God will give them a chance. So uh, are we praying? Are our prayers going to be heard? God is going to give them a second chance? Or are we praying and it is like of no value? It is useless of us praying? <laughs> That's what to know because I also pray. I pray for all the all the souls that have departed from the earth. Everyone was not good. Everyone was good and bad in their own ways. So, I mean, I think our prayers are also needed for God to have mercy on them and give them a second chance, even though they are dead and gone on their judgment day. Uh, Vanessa, you mentioned a second chance for those who come up in the resurrection or on the, on the judgment day, right? Now, for someone who has never heard the gospel and never known Christ, there is no question of second chance. That's the first chance, right? <laughs> so, uh, uh, once again, I, I would believe that whether it is on judgment day or whether it was in some other way, God would never, you know, uh, throw someone in the lake of fire just because that person never knew Christ or, you know, uh, unless the person has accepted Christ or had the chance to accept Christ, I don't, you know, there is nothing to indicate that God is going to let them uh, slip through his fingers. Now, you said you, you're praying that they would have a, they would, uh, you know, have an opportunity to be saved. Isn't that right? You are praying that those who have departed. Now, uh, yes, we need to pray. And uh, we need to pray even today that many more will hear the gospel. But maybe what we should keep in mind is that everyone has to, what you say, uh, accept Christ. Salvation is in Christ. Now, we may pray, but if the person doesn't accept, then, of course, uh, you know, our prayers, I'm not sure how that prayer is to be answered, right? Uh, so every person has to, for example, I mean, if you pray someone wants, you know, the someone will be given salvation, if that person doesn't want salvation, uh, how is the prayer going to be answered? Uh, for God is not going to force the person and say, well, Vanessa prayed, I'm sorry, you have to accept salvation. I'm going to force it down your throat. I don't think God does that. Uh, does that help, uh, Vanessa? 
Okay. Yes, it tells. Right. Bertie, go ahead. Uh, I would say my conversion or my uh, calling to uh, to uh, believe and trust in the Lord or to receive and to receive him as my personal Lord and Savior and to change a conversion of heart it was purely a miracle because I, I you know I was like many others I was quite comfortable in the Christ, in the Catholic faith uh, during those uh, pre-conversion uh, uh, while I was in the Catholic faith I used to say uh, it is the true religion, in fact, you know, uh, it sounded so, I mean, true, and then nothing could be, uh, you know, uh, other than that, that's the true religion. But when the when the calling came, and I, you know, God opened my heart uh, to, to receive his son, you know, and to believe in his salvation, and to be brought into salvation, was I, I, I look at it as a pure miracle. Uh, so my question is, what about the the Bible says the whole world is deceived. You know, it's a, a deceived world. And uh, uh, whether, you know, it's uh, what do you call it, uh, God, whom God foreknew, he predestinated them and all that, and uh, unto glorification, brought them into glorification. Uh, does God work that way? I know his grace is manifold, and his grace sometimes goes beyond our logic. But as for me personally, I feel like coming to know Christ and being now, in the faith of Christ is pure miracle, and I'm sustained by God, by His Spirit. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Bertie, for uh, the fact that you mentioned that it's a miracle, and uh, uh, and I'm presuming you recognize that as the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Yes. And maybe that is the answer to the question that you have asked. The world is deceived, but the ministry of the Holy Spirit is very real today in the lives of almost, you know, all of humanity. Now, we can't see it. The, as it says, Jesus says, the wind blows and we don't know, you know, where it comes from or where it goes. The spirit is like that. The spirit, the Holy Spirit continues to do his ministry. And is it possible that so many who still reject God and remain in a sense of deception may suddenly, like you, have a miracle and the minds open and a conviction rests upon them. And they say, oh, now I see it. Jesus is the Lord. Right? Yes. So I don't know how it works. But the, the workings of the Holy Spirit are extremely important. That's why we in GCI say that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is, is very essential and very important. Because this is the day and age when the Holy Spirit is working. And we hope that the working of the Holy Spirit will bring about that miracle that you yourself experienced in the lives of millions and billions of people. Right? Yeah. Anyone like to add to that? Yes, Franklin, go ahead. Sir. <coughs> Sir. Yes. In my understanding, grace has got an objective aspect and a subjective aspect. Objective, God's objective grace, it includes the totality of humanity. Okay. From everyone, but no, sir, you have to receive the grace and you have to accept it. Yes, you are correct, Franklin. Was there a question there or was it just a statement? Just a statement, sir. Okay, yeah. Uh, so, but, but the question, once again, that might come out of what you're saying is, will everybody receive it? Yes. Will finally everybody receive it? And what we are saying is, the Bible seemed to indicate that there may be some who may not uh, decide to receive it. And that's why we do not subscribe to universalism. Universalism in the sense that even without repentance and acceptance of Jesus and receiving it, that you will be saved. Uh, we don't teach that. Praveen, you had a talk. Go ahead. As we are discussing about this matter, this what uh, this is what comes to my mind, uh, especially when we talk about universalism, or you talk about predestination, or when you talk about uh, Calvinism, about limited atonement, and even salvation. Uh, we all are have. I mean, most of the times we are making, uh, you know, 
so when we are when we are discussing about these, we already have a concept of salvation, and in most of these discussions, the value of salvation has been, uh, I mean, it has been undervalued and it has been uh, limited uh, from what it is really. Most of the time, see, as we are talking about universalism, we are thinking about somebody died and the salvation is about they raising up and going to heaven. That's what we are thinking. But salvation is not about that. Of course, that is one of the aspects of the salvation. But that is not the salvation itself. When we are saved, we are not saved into heaven. When we are saved, we are not saved into a resurrection. When we are saved, we are not saved into some kind of a timeless, timeless living state. When we are saved, we are saved into a relationship. That's what we have to remember. That, that's why John reminds us, whoever believe in Jesus, he had given the right to become the children of God. It is not written, whoever believed in him, he had given the right to become the citizens of heaven. Okay. And uh, we, even in the previous discussions also, in the previous Bible studies, we have seen uh, the age that is going to come is uh, like an age where the dimensions of God and human dimensions are going to be intersected and we are going to be live in that uh, uh, dimensions but most of the times as we are talking about these subjects we are undervaluing the salvation to some kind of journey towards uh, a destination salvation it is not about a destination that we need to realize salvation is actually enter, enter, entering into a new uh, relationship which has no bounds that is where we are entering into the life of God uh, so, when, when salvation is a relationship, it is definitely both, it is a two-way road. Okay, From God's side, he has accomplished everything and he is universal in, in, his, in his part. And uh, there is no way that God is going to force us, uh, either by his determination we talk about, or predestination things which we are talking about, either by limited atonement or unlimited, uh, unlimited election, whatever we talk about, in which he is not going to violate the other party, other side, which is our participation. He's not going to violate it now, no, not even in the future and never. Uh, so he always maintains uh, that uh, relational uh, nature of the salvation. And we, are, we need to think salvation in those terms. Most of the times when we talk about universalism or limited atonement, sometimes un, uh, unknowingly we will be trying to step into the shoes of God and uh, to talk about the destiny of somebody. Uh, I guess uh, if we are looking, uh, uh, I hope you understand what am I trying to say. I'm not, when we talk about these matters, most of the times, we want to find somebody, so all, all are going to be in heaven or not in the future sense. So we do the, the, the speaking about it and uh, share, uh, I mean, we, while we're speaking about it, we'll step in God's place and say, uh, and we uh, discuss so many uh, matters which we should not be doing. And one last thing I would like to uh, remind you that is our God is a God of infinite possibilities. He is not a God of infinite certainties. Okay, the moment certain it comes, it is no more a possibility. Bible speaks about God is a God of infinite possibilities. So what these possibilities does to us is it humbles us. You know, for either yeah, you talk about, if you are a person who speaks about limited atonement or you, if you are a person who speaks about universalism, both places by taking the scripture and scriptural portions and we uh, we speak with certainty that in the future it is going to be like this these people are going to be in heaven these are not going to be in heaven we speak with certainty that is where god reminds us that he is a god of infinite possibilities and this god he puts all of us uh, he tells all of us all of the, the thoughts about certainty are not correct because he himself is god of possibilities so that humbles us, whether you are a universalist or a limited atonement person. We have to humble ourselves as we talk about the future of humanity or anybody. Future is not certain for anyone and we don't have anything to talk about. And it seems our God is a God of infinite possibilities. We can, uh, there is nothing wrong, wrong in hoping and desiring all to be saved as he does. And theologically, as far as 
the scripture is concerned and the limited information we have received uh, we have received an understanding we have received and uh, we don't agree that all will be saved so it is okay you know to leave it into the hands of god so there is nothing wrong hope, hoping that all to be saved like vanessa said you can we we all have this hope we can hope all you know your parent your mother and all we don't know what kind of conviction they had they, when they died we do no man enter into the mind of other man we don't know if they had conviction or not we think since they did not step into church they are not convicted we don't know what happened god as berti said god works in miraculous ways in the last moment just like in the life of the thief who died along with jesus there can be a conviction we don't know so we better not to speak about the destiny of somebody about the future of somebody and that is god's realm and we have to leave it in that and we need the one thing we need to develop for ourselves is when we talk about these subjects to look at salvation more as a relationship so that helps i believe yes thanks sir praveen i think uh, uh it is good that we we need to mention that god is a god of possibilities in other words he is never limited uh, we might or you know be limited in terms of possibilities but not god and like you rightly said uh, salvation is you know a, a relationship i would like to say it's a union and a relationship uh, it is only in christ we can have that relationship uh, but i think what is crucial to understand is salvation is not a thing it is not a graduation certificate you stand in line and uh, and then you know you receive a graduation certificate from god saying uh, you have arrived uh, no it's 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 uh, it's a relationship and that's the reason why i think some people might want to uh, will have a problem with it because they don't want to have a relationship with christ they want to go off and do their own thing and uh, like uh, mr dikat said and i think even praveen said god is not going to violate the choice they want to make if they want to do their own thing uh, god is allowing them you know he has to give them the freedom to choose but objectively like franklin said so salvation is available to all the question is whether they want to have a relationship with the person of jesus christ through whom we will then have access to the life of the trinity in the father son holy spirit does that make sense any thoughts on uh, anyone want to come back on that franklin go ahead sir there is a, in, in the book of peter no sir second peter it says uh, god is not uh, god is not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance salvation is offered to anyone and everyone yes and that scripture also shows that there is a choice to make yes. see god desires his desire is that we should be saved but who who who's making the choice god is choosing but then we also have to make a choice like because it's a relationship we must choose to be in that relationship otherwise uh, you know uh, it doesn't work right <laughs> one one single point i would like to add to the scripture frankly reminded us and this is one of the scripture very badly abused uh, to tell that god god wants everybody to be saved and if he is a god if he has a will desire to save everybody and he has to do that and he will accomplish that no it is not necessary for god to um, make everything that he want to happen okay that's what that is not the thing we find in the scripture from genesis uh, till revelation okay so he desires everybody to be saved uh, that does not mean he have to do it and everybody will be saved that's how people interpret it it is not and as i uh, told previously uh, as jesus also jesus said uh, all things are possible with god as i said god is a god of possibilities not certainties this is one of the uh places where we need to take this theme he is able and uh, he is able to save everyone but he that verse is not speaking certainly that he is saving everyone he is able he is possible but he still as uh, doesn't violate our 
uh, the freedoms he had given to us. And uh, so one thing, it humbles us to remember that he is a God of possibilities and uh, humbles us <coughs> that um, uh, we cannot say if God is sovereign, so he has to exercise his sovereignty always. He is sovereign, but he is not slave to his sovereignty. Uh, he is able enough to save everybody. He is powerful enough, but he is not slave to utilize that always. So that's where we have to humble ourselves theologically. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, we need to recognize that just because God desires, that does not mean to say that uh, he is He is now uh, sort of bound his hands, tied his hands to do it uh, by hook or crook. <laughs> that's not the way it should be understood. Anil, you had a thought? Yes. Uh, yeah, we are talking about God being desirous of saving everyone, that everybody should come to Christ and he wants and so on. How does this reconcile with predestination where God has already decided who, also, who will come to Christ? Okay. I think, um, Franklin, you, you spoke on predestination this Sunday. Uh, would you like to explain that, uh, answer that question, explain what predestination is from God's perspective? Sir, uh, the, 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 again, there are two components, objectively and subjectively. Objectively, predestination means uh, Christ's sacrifice has included anyone and everyone who has lived, who is living, who will ever live into the triune circle, objectively. But to make this a reality in our personal lives, uh, we have to receive the gift of God's grace. No, but then, you know, the question is, you know, Romans 8 says that the, whom God, uh, you know, foreknew, he predestined, whom he predestined, he called, whom he called, he, uh, you know, justified, whom he justified, he glorified. So that means there is predestined, he's already decided who is going to be saved, right? So, so how do you reconcile this with God wanting that, you know, everybody should come to Christ and he is desiring that they... But he has already decided who is to come. So what's the point in desiring others to come? Do you, you understand what I'm saying? Franklin. Okay. Praveen, you want to answer that? Uh, yeah. Definitely. Uh, many of the times we talk about predestination and uh, we consider predestination as God is choosing a, a few people. God chose Dan, Franklin and Anil to go to heaven and the rest of us to hell. That is not the predestination. When the verse said... Um, Blessed be the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, just as he chose us, where? He did not choose us anywhere, uh, you and me and so forth. He chose us in Christ. In Christ is the key to understand all these. Okay, he chose us in Christ and then uh, where he chose us in Christ. And uh, for what purpose did he choose? He, uh, in Christ, he, paid, uh, he chose us to be his children. Now, coming to this question, God wants to make everyone his children in Jesus, and he accomplished that, adopting entire humanity in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Did he accomplish it? Yes, he did. He, uh, in, uh, when we talk about predestination, God did not choose Praveen or Dan, God chose Jesus. And when God chose Jesus, whoever is in Jesus are chosen. Who is in Jesus? All things are created in him, through him, for him, and by him. So all are in Jesus. And in Jesus, God has predestined uh, all for what? To be his children. And he made all of us his children. Now the question is, whether we want to be his children or not, that's into our hands. He made us his children. Okay, that's why Paul could go very confidently and tell the Greek people and say, that our father, he is not away from us. He is close to us. And one of your writers said, we are also his offspring. Paul could see all of us as children of God. And it is into the hands of people, whether they want to live as the children of God, want to become children of God. Uh, and that's why John also said, we all believe in him. He had given the right to become the children of God. These words have to be understood in this way. Whoever believes in Jesus, they are claiming the right that was given to them to be called the children of God. 
and those who do not claim, they will not utilize it. So in this, he is predestined and he accomplished what he predestined. And it, it also gives us the freedom to choose. Does it make any sense? Uh, Franklin, uh, sorry, uh, I think Franklin wanted to respond. Uh, are you okay? Okay. Yes, yeah. Yes, Bertram, go ahead. It's uh, interesting uh, uh, what uh, um, Anil and Praveen are trying to uh, throw light on that. But uh, when it says, uh, whom God foreknew, he predestinated. But there's another something attached to predestinated, which says, uh, predestinated to conform to the image of his firstborn son, Jesus Christ. And as a child of God, uh, uh, we have that image uh, in us, or God is conforming us to the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Uh, maybe that can be helpful where that uh, thing is mentioned attached to predestinated, predestinated to conform to the image of his firstborn son, Jesus Christ. And we follow, we follow in it. Absolutely. Theologically, the same point, Bertie, what you said are consider, yes. was considered as adoption. Yes. Conforming yes. to the image of his son is be yes. adopting us as his children. Yes, yes. Okay, yes, uh, Rekha, go ahead. Yes, God wants to use humans to spread the gospel. Uh, Jesus Christ has done his part, but whereas the first fruits we have to do uh, uh, to spread the gospel, and maybe he uses us to spread it more. And as such, we have a work to perform, but we have to spread it and people have to come to, to understand it through us maybe. And of course, God, the Holy Spirit will do everything, but we have to do our part too. Yes, how does that, yes. that, I mean, what does that do with predestination? That's why we are, we are like his workers. God wants to use us. So we are predestined in that okay. sense. That's why. I look, I can already see another, another Bible study coming up very soon. <laughs> we are going to discuss predestination and what it means. So uh, this is very important. I think our, our time is more or less gone today. But let me end by with this one verse, I think 1 Corinthians chapter 15, perhaps just to bring another perspective to this uh, aspect of predestination. In verse 21, it says, for since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. Verse 22, for as in Adam all die, so even in Christ shall all be made alive. So in other words, in Christ, we were predestined to be in Christ so that we would have the opportunity for life. But, the, but once again, we go back to what we were discussing. It has to be, uh, it, since it's a relationship, it has to be chosen. So let me uh, stop with that. And I think what we will do is, uh, we'll, let's take up this topic on predestination and uh, we will discuss it more thoroughly in the days to come. Thank you again for joining us today. What a pleasure it is to have you all, uh, uh, you know, participate and uh, this tremendous amount of learning that comes along. Uh, okay, so uh, I, I keep looking to see who can close in prayer. Is there any volunteers today? <laughs> Some of you may be, you know, not, not, not very appreciative of my volunteering you, but any volunteers would like to pray and close in prayer in in. in the worship, the worship. Anil, go ahead. Let's bow our heads. <clears throat> Almighty God in heaven, we are so blessed. We are so grateful for all your wonderful blessings, Lord. We are so grateful that we are able to meet. We are able to fellowship on even long distance, Father, and particularly for Rekha and me, Lord, that we are able to keep in touch with our Indian brethren and discuss and most of all glorify you, Lord. Because that's what the whole objective of our being here is, to do your will and to glorify you, Lord. At the same time, Lord, we understand that there are so many things you have not chosen to reveal to us. And that's fine. We need to accept that rather than, you know, speculate and go into all kinds of gymnastics. But help us to remember that and help us in any case to whatever you reveal to us, to use the best we can of that and glorify you with that, Lord. So we thank you, Lord, for all these opportunities you give us. And we just pray, may your blessings be upon all of us. Guide us throughout, uh, Lord, uh, in our case, in the day. And of course, for the Indian brethren for the evening. And Lord, 
just uh, we, we just love you and we pray god may your grace and mercy be upon us all thank you so much lord we pray and ask this in jesus holy name amen amen thank you again for all joining us and uh, may i end by saying may the love of god the grace of our lord jesus and the fellowship of the holy spirit be with you all god bless you <laughs>